Well, welcome everyone to this Federalist Society virtual event. Today, April 15, 2021, we're having a discussion on constitutional interpretation and a new book titled The Hollow Core of Constitutional Theory, Why We Need the Framers. I'm Nick Marr, Assistant Director, Assistant Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that expressions of opinion on our call today are those of our experts. Um, two quick notes for the audience before some more brief introductions. Uh, one, if you'd like to order this book, you can visit the Cambridge University Press website and enter the code THCCT2021. And that'll be sent out in the chat. That's for uh, attendees of this, uh, of this panel. Uh, two, we'll be looking to you for questions towards the end of the hour. So please submit your questions via chat as we go along and we'll be monitoring those. We'll pick those out towards the end. Okay, logistics out of the way. I'll now introduce our moderator before she takes the program away. We're very pleased to be joined this afternoon by the Honorable Britt Grant, who serves on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. She was appointed to the federal bench in 2018 after serving as a justice on the Supreme Court of Georgia and as Georgia's Solicitor General. Her longer bio is available on the FedSoc website. Uh, but with that, thanks very much for being with us today. Judge Grant, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. It's my pleasure. Um... This is an exciting new book, but before we start our substantive discussion, I'd like to introduce our panelists. First is Don Drakeman, our author, who is also a distinguished, distinguished research professor in the program in constitutional studies at the University of Notre Dame. He's the author of seven books, and his writings have been cited by the Supreme Court of the United States and the Philippines. Professor Drakeman earned his JD from Columbia University and a PhD from Princeton University. Welcome. Um, next will be Professor Lawrence Solom, who is a William L. Matheson and Robert M. Morgenthau Distinguished Professor of Law <clears throat> and Douglas D. Drysdale Research Professor of Law at the University of Virginia School of Law. A leading constitutional theorist who has written widely on originalism, Professor Solom earned his JD from Harvard Law School and clerked for Judge William Norris on the Ninth Circuit. Professor Keith Whittington is the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Politics at Princeton University. Professor Whittington earned his PhD in political science from Yale and is the author of several groundbreaking books, including his 1999 work entitled Constitutional Interpretation, Textual Meaning, Original Intent, and Judicial Review. We're so fortunate to have these three great scholars of originalism here to discuss Professor Jakeman's book. And with that, I will let Professor Jakeman take it away. Super. Thanks so much, Judge Grant. Thank you to the panelists and all of you who are taking time out of your day to uh, listen to this uh, discussion. Please do come in with questions later on. So my basic point here is that for basically all of Western legal history, identifying the will of the lawmaker has been the core of interpretation. But for the fast past 50 years, constitutional theory has largely forgotten about the framers. Instead, the arguments revolve on the one side around original public meaning, and on the other, a host of living, common sense, consequentialist, moral or pragmatic alternatives. If you look back at the history, it's really remarkable, clear, remarkably clear. Look at Koch back in the 1600s summarizing what was then already a long tradition. Every statute ought to be expounded according to the intent of them that made it. Blackstone said basically the same thing, as did Framer James Wilson, Justice Joseph Story, and basically just about everybody else writing about constitutional and statutory interpretation uh, until about the 20th century. That was the law then for nigh on 20 centuries. What happened? Well, several things, quite a few different things actually happened. Legal realism, uh, the growth of the living constitution and Justice Brennan, Justice Scalia's focus on textualism, the common law case method in the law schools. We can point in a lot of directions, but even among originalists, what used to be called the jurisprudence of original intent in the Reagan administration has now given way largely, not completely, but the trajectory of many of the current originalist theorists is away from the framers and uh, toward semantic meeting. Now, 
Why is that? And what's going on? Well, just about everybody, and this is originalists as well as living constitutionalists and everybody else, seem to agree that the framers' intentions are some combination of unknowable and, in any event, irrelevant. And since everybody has bought into what John Manning's called intense skepticism, we haven't given enough thought into why the framers were jettisoned and why we've lost what was the core of interpretation for all those centuries. And that's really the project of my book. Now, a couple of quick things you'll say, wait a minute, Article 7 settles this, the ratifiers made the constitution into law. And so we don't really have good records from the ratification conventions. That leaves us with the public meeting. There's not much left. This issue is really a red herring. I think it's terrific. It's actually one of legal history's great misdirects. This is a Wizard of Ozian, pay no attention to the framers behind the curtain move by the convention. So if you look at the Constitutional Convention, its sole purpose under the Articles was to amend the Articles of Confederation. And any amendment that they came up with was required to be approved by all of the state legislatures. But that's not what they did. They came up with an entirely new constitution. And instead of submitting it to the legislatures, they came up with Article 7, this brand new idea of ratification, and that ratification would be done in conventions, not legislatures, and it would be good if only nine approved it. So this is the framers bootstrapping their way into a whole new constitutional order. And it became law partially because they said so and partially because we've accepted the fact that they said so over all these years. So then the second big complaint about the framers' intentions is what's often called the summing problem. How can dozens of framers all have the same intent? And the answer is that intent may be a little bit of a misnomer. What, what interpreters have always looked for is the end means decision. What was the final choice by the lawmaker about what they were trying to accomplish and how they were trying to accomplish it? All of the framers, whether they came in with the similar ideas or very different ideas, by the time it got to a final vote on a provision, knew what that provision was meant to do and how it would do it. They may have agreed with it, they may have disagreed with it, but they knew what it was. What we're looking for is what they knew it was. So note that this is not necessarily an argument for framers expected applications. It could be, might not be. Whether the framers meant for their own idea of how to apply a law to be perpetually used in the future is a question we should ask of the record, not assume going in in advance. Lawyers in the founding era, interestingly, uh, were well aware of dynamic, uh, you know, updating types of interpretations. We can see them doing it when they invoke the Magna Carta to support the Patriot cause, for example. So the key to dynamic approaches, and when they're appropriate, is to identify the will of the lawmaker. Then you look at the nature of the changing circumstance, and you say, can we apply the will of the lawmaker to the changing circumstances in a way that's consistent with the framers' original choices? Finally, the lament that the, frame, that the, uh, the justices of the Supreme Court are really just making things up is usually what we've said in the past to things that we disagreed with. But over the last generation, there have been a group of constitutional theorists who have said that the court is a policymaker, should be a policymaker, and that all of the traditional language of interpretation can simply be used as a good cover story after the fact to give legitimacy to a decision made on other grounds. I think that's a bad idea. Uh, truth telling is an important value in our legal system, and we should expect judges to lead the way and tell the truth. So if they're gonna act like policymakers, they should talk like policymakers and explain their decisions as just basic policy decisions. You made one law, we like this other law better. And then the other branches of government and uh, Keith Whittington's new commission can decide on uh, exactly what the proper role of the Supreme Court should be in 21st century America. Thanks very much for taking the time today to talk about this book.
Thanks very much. <clears throat> I believe Professor Whittington, I believe you're next. Correct me if, if I if I Professor Solom was next. Professor Solom, thank you for that. Professor Solom. Thank you. Uh, and I have uh, some slides. So um, uh, this is a wonderful book. And I uh, urge uh, everyone in the audience who's interested in constitutional theory to read the book. Um, uh, I think my job, though, is to offer some criticism. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, so uh, are we really going back to the future original intentions again? Well. I want to just start by framing this. Uh, the the, the um, modern origins of the move from original intentions to original public meaning uh, are strongly associated with uh, Justice Scalia, uh, who had been uh, critical of congressional intent as an approach to statutory interpretation. A battle he's largely he largely won. Um, uh, but there are a lot of myths about uh, what uh, public meaning originalism and textualism is all about. Uh, uh, some people argue that this must be literal meaning or bare semantic meaning, and, and that's just a distortion. The reality is that public meaning originalism embraces context. The public meaning of the constitutional text is the communicative content delivered by the text given the publicly available context of constitutional communication. In the determination of original meaning, evidence of uh, intentions plays a role, right? Evidence of original intentions is relevant evidence of the public meaning of the words, but it is the public meaning and not the psychological states of the framers, the intentions of the framers that is binding. There are three different theories of original intent that play a role in contemporary constitutional discourse. One of those uh, is the idea of original intent as the will of the framers with respect to constitutional uh, issues. I'm going to call that framers preference originalism. And I believe that this is Drakeman's bottom line view. He frames that view in terms of a means ends uh, relationship, but uh, uh, the choice of means and the choice of ends are framers preferences. Second view. Original intent is the communicative intentions of the framers. This is framers meaning originalism. This is the version of original intentions originalism that emphasizes the idea that um, the framers had intended meaning for the words and that that intended meaning is what's determinative. Usually this view is based on a philosophical theory, Paul Grice's theory of linguistic communication. It's sometimes called the new intentionalism. It's discussed in Drakeman's book. Uh, Larry Alexander and Jeff Goldsworthy are, are leading proponents. And then there's a third version of original intentions originalism that associates original intent with the original objective purpose of the constitutional provision. This is Richard Eakin's view, and uh, it is developed out of a philosophical view about meaning uh, that's associated with Eakin's mentor, uh, the moral philosopher and legal philosopher John Finnis. So uh, objective purposes, the purpose that a good legislature would have had in passing a statute is quite different than either the meaning, the communicative content intended by the framers and the subjective will of the framers as concrete individuals with mental states. These three theories are fundamentally incompatible with each other. You have to choose. You can't embrace all three. They rely on uh, entirely different premises and are associated with different views about what should determine constitutional outcomes. So let's talk about the summing problem. So summing problem number one, the traditional summing problem with framers preferences. So the constitutional preferences of the framers 
on many, but not necessarily all constitutional issues are going to differ. Uh, and here I just think that Professor Drakeman has it wrong. Framers disagreed with respect to many constitutional provisions, both as to what the goal was uh, and as to what means they had chosen. And, and uh, there are many notorious examples, but the uh, necessary and proper clauses, I think, uh, are a particularly clear and important example. Uh, Drakeman, to solve the summing problems, invokes the group agent solution discussed by Eakins, and Eakins in turn relies on the philosopher uh, Philip Pettit and his uh, uh, co-author Christian List, uh, it, who, who I think argue very persuasively that a group agent can act intentionally uh, via the rules that structure its processes. But the problem is that this solution can't do the work that Drakeman needs. The relevant group intentions are thin because the processes that structure the convention are thin and therefore, con whereas uh, constitutional preferences are thick, there is a mismatch here. Eakins, to solve this problem, relies on objective purpose, but Drakeman rejects that approach and thereby uh, uh, undercuts the solution that he relies on to, to uh, 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 attempt to vanquish the summing problem. What about the second summing problem, semantic summing, which uh, Professor Drakeman discusses? He, he points to semantic ambiguity here, the fact that there were different semantic meanings for words and phrases in the Constitution. Public meaning originalism maintains that in almost all cases, semantic ambiguity can be liquidated by context. Drakeman invokes context to show that the intended, uh, to show the intended meaning on his account of original intentions. But if this context is publicly available, it is exactly the way public meaning originalism solves the problem of ambiguity. And it's liquidated by context. And if some cases of irreducible ambiguity are fatal, and this is the way Drakeman's argument works, then Framer's preference originalism <laughs> fails as well because of course there are uh, ambiguities about purpose. Uh, so in actual cases of irreducible ambiguity, to the extent there are such cases, we're in a construction zone and the solution is a theory of constitutional construction. I have a lot more I would love to say, but I am out of time, so I will stop now. Thank you. Very interesting to hear those pieces of pushback. Um, Professor Whittington. Uh, so thank you. And, and uh, I appreciate uh, uh, Professor Dregman for uh, the book, which is uh, very interesting and useful and I think well worth um, checking out if you have any interest in these kinds of problems at all. Uh, and I think Professor Solom did lay on the table um, some of the uh, important concerns. One of the striking things about um, the book as a contribution to our ongoing thinking about um, originalism in particular, uh, let alone constitutional interpretation more generally, um, is it is an effort to revive to some degree uh, this intentionalist emphasis um, in originalism. Um, as Professor Solom emphasized, um, there are other intentionalist schools um, of thought out there, um, others who continue to emphasize the significance of the framers' intentions uh, for an originalist uh, project. Um, but Professor Dregman um, does uh, add to that a somewhat different approach um, to thinking about about it and moreover sort of a general um, emphasis on the significance of uh, thinking about intentions. Um, as the Dregman book highlights and as Solem's um, uh, comments um, suggest, we have been shifting away generally from that kind of emphasis on framers' intentions over the last several years with a much greater attention um, to the public meaning of the text um, in recent constitutional theory, I've often thought that we wind up overemphasizing um, the division between intentionalism um, and public meaning as we've um, approached this. The intentions are what was traditionally viewed as intentions are often helpful uh, for thinking about um, these problems, even from an original public meaning um, perspective. And as uh, Professor Solom emphasized, um, that's partially true because intentions are part of how we get at the context um, in which words are being used. Um, and context is crucial um, to thinking about um, the meaning of uh, the constitutional text um, from an original uh, public meaning uh, perspective that we need to understand uh, not only what the words might mean in a dictionary semantic context, but also uh, what the words meant in the specific context in which they were being adopted uh, by 
by a specific set of lawmakers in a specific historical moment uh, undertaking a specific historical project. Um, and the kind of evidence that we think of uh, from a constitutional intentions perspective is part of the evidence that we would want to turn to from any kind of originalist perspective, I think in order to make sense um, of, of that constitutional text. Um, so I, I value then this emphasis on uh, uh, paying attention uh, to intentions that Professor Drakeman uh, would want um, to emphasize. Um, the question in part is, uh, does that mean that we need to transition all the way to a primarily intentionalist approach uh, to thinking about these issues? And should we um, abandon um, particular aspects um, of, of public meaning? And I don't think the book um, gives us good reasons to think that we ought to um, uh, move away from the kind of public meaning approach um, that many originalists uh, would emphasize um, uh, in general. And there may be lots of ways of ultimately reconciling uh, part of what Professor Dreckman's concerned with um, and what um, originalists from the public meaning perspective uh, might want to highlight. So one of the concerns uh, for public meaning originalists um, is that the uh, fo uh, exclusive focus on intentions uh, will introduce more ambiguity and more uncertainty about what the meaning of the Constitution is uh, than thinking about public meaning uh, more, more generally. Professor Dregman spends a fair amount of time in the book trying to address what was traditionally characterized as this summing problem. How do we uh, deal with the potential ambiguities that might be uh, embodied in the fact that you have lots of um, uh, different framers with uh, somewhat different views um, uh, expressing themselves in the context of the Philadelphia Convention, likewise ratifiers and the ratif and ratification conventions and how do we uh, reconcile these uh, competing views. Um, that is a particular challenge um, from the intentionalist um, uh, perspective. And one virtue of the original public meaning approach is it does uh, reduce some of those challenges um, by, by uh, focusing our attention less um, on to what degree can we add up these specific um, uh, preferences um, by particular authors and instead think about what's the meaning of the text um, that they wound up um, agreeing on. Um, part of the virtue of shifting uh, to give greater attention uh, to the public meaning approach um, is its emphasis on the extent to which sometimes the specific choices being made by the founders um, is to adopt sets of principles or rules. And one of the traditional problems of a lot of the intentionalist um, approaches, or at least that advocates of intentionalist approaches uh, tended to emphasize, was a great deal of attention to the uh, very concrete policies that might follow uh, from the adoption of specific constitutional texts, sometimes expressed in terms of uh, a problem of expected applications. One thing Professor Drakeman wants to emphasize is that we should not feel ourselves to be wedded to expected applications, um, even if we adopt um, the intentionalist approach. He wants to provide some space um, for thinking that the founders uh, might have been wrong about some of their expectations about how particular applications uh, would play out um, or that they might have ex uh, uh, understanding um, that their expecta expected applications uh, might not carry through uh, in practice, especially to the extent the circumstances um, change um, over time. He wants to cabin that a little bit by um, connecting it to um, uh, the particular context in which they're adopting this. And so some of the question is a historical one um, of to what degree did the framers themselves um, expect that their expected applications uh, would not be uh, binding on future uh, interpreters attempting to apply um, their rules. That might reduce the space to some degree between this more intentionalist approach um, and traditional um, public meaning approaches. Um, but one thing that I think the public meaning approaches would certainly want to emphasize um, is we should be cognizant of the fact that it's sometimes the case that the constitutional drafters um, are choosing to draft um, a constitutional text that includes uh, broad rules um, that um, are going to have to be applied in a variety of uh, circumstances uh, into uh, the future. And that requires an interpreter to try to be thinking not just about what the specific policy preferences are um, of those who are drafting the constitution, but really trying to think about um, uh, what is the larger rule that they laid down and, how, and, and then to exercise judgment to determine how that rule um, ought to be applied um, in particular circumstances. My suspicion is um, there's still going to be a gap between uh, what Professor Drakeman would emphasize and what original public meaning uh, scholars would emphasize about how much judgment uh, future courts and future interpreters are going to have to exercise uh, in order to uh, think through how to apply um, uh, more abstract rules to uh, particular circumstances uh, going forward. Um, 
but I look forward to seeing how this uh, uh, concern winds up uh, developing over time and uh, to what degree does the gap get wider and to what degree does it shrink uh, between uh, Professor Drakeman's view about uh, intentionalism and how it ought to play out in practice and the more traditional, um, uh, what's now traditional, uh, public meaning uh, perspective um, that many um, others uh, would, uh, would emphasize. Um, Professor Drakeman only says um, a few brief words in the book about uh, what to do when you have irreducible ambiguity in the context of the constitutional text. As Professor Solom notes, a lot of the new originalism would emphasize um, that we're now in the construction zone when we encounter um, that kind of aspect of the constitution where um, we have to start making uh, political choices, um, exercising political judgment about how to flesh out constitutional rules um, in the face of that kind of, of ambiguity. And it's not clear Professor Drakeman actually thinks we can uh, reduce that uh, core of the construction zone um, to uh, nothing or next to nothing or whether or not it will remain um, a sizable portion of what um, those who are trying to live under a written constitution uh, will have to grapple with uh, moving, uh, moving forward. Um, one uh, feature of the new originalism is to recognize that there is in fact going to be a fair amount of irreducible ambiguity and uncertainty about the meaning of the constitutional text um, that's going to have to be fleshed out in some uh, fashion. Um, intentionalists traditionally were often concerned with with minimizing how much of that um, ambiguity is going to be left in order to um, claim um, a, a very large amount of certainty um, about what the constitution um, actually requires in practice. And it's just not entirely clear to me how far Professor Dreckman would want to go in that direction um, of claiming that the constitutional text, if properly interpreted, uh, will provide clear answers uh, to the full range of constitutional questions we want to encounter or whether or not um, uh, we will still be confronted uh, with a significant amount of uncertainty uh, about what the constitution requires and as a consequence be confronted with the necessity um, of making some choices um, about what to do uh, with the constitutional text, um, even given uh, this particular form of, of originalism. Um, so I look forward to hearing more uh, from Mr. Dreckman today, uh, but also in the future as we see this kind of approach um, laid out. But it's um, an interesting uh, new addition to the originalist debates, highlights some features um, of our thinking about originalism that I think uh, he correctly um, suggests that we have not been paying enough attention to. Um, and there's a great deal of value then in, in trying to pay more attention to the, some of the arguments he's putting on the table. Thank you. Some interesting feedback there too. I think the, one of the last points you made, Professor Whittington, I think is a great place to start the moderated discussion, which is, Professor Jigman, how much do you see your theory reducing the amount of ambiguity that um, scholars and courts are dealing with versus um, simply being a different mode of interpretation that, that might lead us to a, a more correct answer that still leaves significant ambiguity. I know there's been a lot of discussion about reduce strategies to reduce ambiguity in, in lots of um, textual interpretations, but where do you see your theory coming into play on that front? Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks to all of you for the great insights. And that's a super question, Judge Grant. I think this whole project came out of, of ambiguity. Uh, and you'll probably say it, it ends up with a lot of ambiguity. Uh, but, but I'm, you know, my main background, I'm a church state scholar. And uh, I've written a lot about the Establishment Clause. And, and where I came out was you do it as fairly as possible to the evidence. You look at the techniques of, uh, you know, OPM originalism, uh, semantic meeting, context, everything else, you get at least four different answers. Four, as far as I can see, uh, as a historian, as a, 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 a lawyer, four equally plausible uh, ways to read the Constitution that you, there's simply no good reason to pick one over the other except for the fact that it's really quite clear that the first Congress was picking one over the others. And if you're gonna look solely at the broader co context and do what, and again, so it's a matter of how hardcore your, your OPM originalism is, if you don't look at all at the records of the, the first Congress, uh, then you're gonna miss that. If you look only there, and don't look at the, the public meaning, then, then you'll probably come up with the right answer, but for the wrong reason. My view is that the key philosophical issues that, that Professor Solon points to and Professor Whittington are great issues. 
Most of all, I want to take those cases where OPM generates, if done fairly, generates ambiguity. And I pick the excise tax clause and the establishment clause as basically, on the one hand, a third of the federal budget, and on the other hand, about uh, you know five dozen cases in the Supreme Court. And I say, I don't think you can resolve those without going specifically to the, the problem they were trying to solve and how they were trying to solve it. That's what Justice Patterson did in the first excise ta tax case, and it's what it was re-emphasized by the Chief Justice uh, in the Affordable Care Act case. So uh, that's where it all came from. Uh, at the end of the day, to go to Professor Whittington's question, this is not gonna let us uh, answer all our questions uh, because one of our questions is what questions should the courts be answering? And the, so far, the court has basically been saying, well, if it's an important public and social policy, we'll answer it. Uh, that historically has not been the case. And historically, um, uh, commissions like the one Professor Whittington's going to be a part of, but perhaps oriented somewhat differently, have looked at uh, jurisdiction stri stripping and court packing as the mildest possible alternatives. Uh, Charles I preferred the Star Chamber, uh, and, uh, and earlier Roman emperors simply uh, seized the judges' property and banished them to foreign lands. Uh, you can put that on the list for your, your committee discussions, Professor Whittington. Um, so uh, I think that, that there's going to be no end to both vagueness and, and ambiguity uh, in interpretation. That's what, you know, several millennia have told us. Uh, I'm not really arguing that we should pick the flip framers intentions in place of what the public meaning is. I'm arguing that if you really dig into the public meaning, you're going to find there's more of it than appears on the surface because we're looking at it from two centuries later. And when we look backwards, the issues seem pretty clear. When you look forwards from the history, they're not so clear. And so uh, ultimately, there are going to be questions to which there's no answer. And then, then you get into issues of basic uh, role of the courts in society. But no, you're right. Not, none of this is going to fix it. Uh, but I think I'm a little closer to the Gricean view than Professor Sola would, would give me credit for. Uh, I just don't think it takes us far enough. In response to that, Professor Sola? Oh, you're, you're on mute. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna just emphasize first how terrific the book is. Uh, and uh, I, I, absolutely agree that the Constitution is riddled with semantic ambiguities. Of course it is. Almost every word in the English language has more than one meaning, more than one sense. Uh, and so in order to understand the Constitution, uh, we have to look beyond the words and understand the context in which it was written. And an important part of that context is the problems they were trying to solve. So I would agree uh, that in order to understand uh, phrases like excise tax or uh, uh, the idea of an establishment of religion, uh, we need to look beyond the dictionary definitions. Uh, we need to understand uh, what problem was being addressed and uh, when we understand that, uh, we'll be able to figure out what the constitutional text communicated to the public. So maybe we don't disagree at all, maybe, or maybe it's just a, a matter of emphasis. Um, I do think that it's important to understand that they saw the Constitution as different uh, from an ordinary statute. And one of the reasons they thought it was different um, uh, was because uh, uh, they understood it to be uh, an act of democratic self-governance, an act of popular sovereignty. It, it begins with the people. And uh, as uh, Chief Justice Mar John Marshall said in Gibbons v. Ogden, uh, it's because the people adopted the constitution, and it has to be understood 
to have employed words in their natural sense. So uh, uh, I think public meaning originalism reflects a profound difference created by uh, a, a constitution adopted by the people as something that's really quite unlike statutes adopted by parliament uh, or ordinances established by kings. That was, that was actually a question that I had as I was listening to everyone's remarks. Um, Professor Jacobin, how much daylight do you actually think there is between your proposed method and what a lot of originalists, OPM original scholars seem to think is the importance of context in determining that original public meeting? Where, where do you see the differences between those two? So I think that, that there ought to be not much if their view of context is, uh, is broad enough, because I think my view of uh, public meaning is broad enough to overlap. And so you really get to the question of, of on the spectrum of OPM originalists, uh, you have the Corpus Linguistics Dictionary Group that just say, we could go out there and, and measure something or, or look something up and there's your meaning and we're not gonna look at anything else. Uh, I, those are the people that, that I, I probably have the most distance from. Uh, and then there are, you know, Professor Solom's triangulation method, or I mean, both Professor Solom, Professor Whittington are far more friendly to the framers than uh, a number of folks that are on the, uh, like I, what I would call the, the Justice Scalia end of, of uh, you know, I'm not interested in what the framers had to say. I'm only interested in the words they picked. And I would say, I'm interested in both. And, and I, I don't think that's gonna drive a lot of different things. I'd be, I would not take the position necessarily that I can dream up an intention of the framers that does not overlap with at least one equally good objective public meaning. I just think, again, I'm a historian. For, you know, and therefore spend too much time looking at the context. And I think if you do that, you realize like they found out in, you know, they had a debate in Congress over the excise word. And what they agreed upon was that people in New England thought it meant something different than what people in Virginia thought. Okay, so we've got that in the record. What do you do about that? What do you pick? Uh, you can flip a coin, you can count word usages in a corpus, or you can say, this, the excise tax was, was a result of a deal. It was a compromise. So not a particularly attractive one. Uh, nobody wanted it going in. Uh, it was the, the probably best of a bunch of bad alternatives. And that's what they got to. And so otherwise, as Justice Patterson said, the semantic questions turn in a circle. You go round and round, you find really good evidence on what it means. What's the context? Well, they were arguing about the taxation power. But only when you get right into it and say, why do they care about this issue? Do you come up with the capitation and real property answer that Patterson uh, locked onto uh, and that, that the Chief Justice picked up in the Affordable Care Act case? And that was, in fact, what they did. Uh, so. Anyway, that's, that's a long answer to a short and, and better question. So I'm not, I, my concern is not that OPM originalism is bad. I think it, it needs more history. And when it gets more history, it's going to need more theory to figure out how to deal with, with ambiguities. And that's what I was trying to provide. interesting response. Um, I'll let the audience know we're not quite ready, um, but in the next few minutes, we'll start with some audience questions. So please go ahead and be thinking of your questions and feel free to go ahead and enter them um, so that I can pose some additional questions to the panelists. Um, in the meantime, before we move on to the audience, I've been wondering whether any of the three of you have a concern that a heightened um, focus on the framers' intentions could be used as a um, intentionally or not as a smokescreen for the current thinkers intentions or beliefs about what a constitutional provision ought to mean. I know that was one of the is one of the significant
criticisms of the um, living constitution and other similar theories. But does this, since it um, perhaps is somewhat less objective than other modes of interpretation, at least could be argued, does this provide a new smokescreen for um, folks to maybe move the constitution in the direction that they think it should go? Yes. <laughs> uh, bad intentionalism is probably worse than bad original you know, uh, OPM originalism, uh, but it's still bad intentionalism. And uh, you know what we've done. Uh, you know, take the Wall of Separation or James Madison Memorial and Remonstrance, which has given us this huge and messy jurisprudence about church and state. Uh, that's just bad originalism. Uh, it was it was taking. Uh, a guy who was there in the first Congress and looking at something he said somewhere else about another context and and piping that into your First Amendment because he happened to say something that was really attractive to some no New Deal judges. Uh, that's just, you know, yes, that's a risk. Uh, and uh, and I think that that the balance to that risk is that if we really take the original public meaning research seriously enough, we're going to get ambiguity all over the place and we're going to need a way to resolve it. And this is it. So it, yeah, that's a tough one. That's a great, great question. Any responses from Professor Whittington or Professor Solon before we move on to audience questions? I, I just would say that um, it, 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 you know, uh, a move back to original intent, I think, um, uh, can be seen in two ways. So I think some people uh, uh, are uh, very much attracted by the idea of original intent because they hope it provides more determinacy, right? They are hoping that when we have sort of the concrete, if we honor especially the concrete uh, uh, expectations of the framers with respect to particular constitutional issues, that will thing make things more determinate. But then there's the worry, the worry on the other side is that if we're really talking about constitutional preferences, it's going to turn out that there's a lot of material to work with in the constitutional uh, materials, in part because there were uh, many, many disagreements about what uh, what sort of what ought to happen. And, uh, and then in practice, that can lead to what I think Professor Drakeman is quite rightly very opposed to, which is bad intentionalism or the cherry picking of the quote that indicates the constitutional preference that goes the way you want. And of course, the Supreme Court, um, I think the Supreme Court's um, originalism has gotten much better. And, uh, uh, and I'm especially uh, impressed with some of the originalism uh, that we've seen very recently from the uh, uh, United States Courts of Appeal. But um, as you go back, you see lots of cherry picking of sort of framers intent quotes used uh, uh, acontextually to support a preferred outcome. I have to admit, I become quite impatient with the sort of smokescreen style arguments there. There is a lot of criticism of the court and of originalism, particularly as providing these kind of smokescreens. But fundamentally, it is true that the justices are often uh, influenced by their own policy preferences. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, what particular theory of constitutional interpretation they have um, as to whether or not that's that's a factor um, in uh, how judges uh, behave. And, and I think it's often the case that judges um, are less likely to engage in using originalism as a kind of smokescreen uh, than a worry about a kind of motivated reasoning that you um, have a certain inclination about um, how you think a case ought to come out. Um, um, and it's easy to persuade yourself that the um, arguments uh, line up um, behind uh, that particular uh, rationale. Um, the, the best corrective uh, to that, whether that takes the form of originalism or takes uh, the form of other argumentative styles, um, is to correct bad opinions with uh, better arguments. Um, and that all arguments uh, across the board can be criticized, and we ought to be um, open to criticizing uh, jurists when they, when they make mistakes and, and make uh, bad arguments. 
arguments, but I don't think that's a reason to therefore want to reject an entire approach to thinking about constitutional interpretation so much as a reason to actually taking seriously our, our responsibilities of evaluating the quality of the arguments that we're seeing and criticizing them when they deserve criticism. Two, two great responses, um, important things to remember. Um, so I will start with one question um, that I think includes threads from several of the questions that we have here, which is what role, if any, should the Declaration of Independence play in interpreting any part of the Constitution? Um, I, I won't get into reasons why that's interesting or related to this. I'm sure you can all three think of some, but I, I know several people have questions related to the Declaration and its, its import in these types of discussions. So I'll, I'll answer it from my point of view, but I'd actually be interested in hearing from Professors Whittington and Solom about uh, from, from theirs, how they see it. I, I guess I um, think it's obviously relevant to constitutional interpretation. Uh, the Declaration of Independence uh, is an important uh, part of the public context of constitutional communication. Thinking about the Declaration, the Revolutionary War, the Articles of Confederation, all of that is part of the story. It's part of the uh, basic context that members of the public uh, would have borne in mind as they were reading the words of the Constitution. But frequently, um, uh, when people talk about the Declaration of Independence and uh, the Constitution, they, what they really have in mind um, is the preamble to the Declaration, uh, at, you know, which of course, um, you know, is uh, majestic. Uh, all humans are created equal, right? And so, um, uh, uh, and a, a, a sense of uh, inalienable rights. Um, and, you know, the question is to what role that, that preamble has uh, is important, but I, I, I think that the, the role of the preamble of the declaration um, it is perhaps less important than many people think because the um, underlying uh, 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 sort of political set of political ideas that are an important part of the context of the Constitution and particularly important in interpreting the first eight amendments uh, and the Ninth Amendment and, and later the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment, these ideas are not only to be found in the preamble of the Declaration, right? And in fact, their importance uh, uh, to constitutional interpretation rests in part on the fact that they are pervasive uh, and, and, and that these are not just ideas that appeared in one document a decade or so earlier. And yeah, that strikes me as, as right in general. I am not sure the Declaration does a lot of independent work um, as a, a source of constitutional interpretation, but it's certainly informative um, of the context for thinking about um, the more concrete provisions that appear um, in the federal constitution. I mean, notably the declaration often is uh, cited as um, in, in political debates as well as uh, some judicial opinions in early in American history and trying to think about um, some state constitutional provisions, for example, which often echo very directly the same language as the, as the Declaration of Independence. And so one reason why you might cite it um, is the extent to which it, it mirrors uh, the language in the constitutional text itself. I think as Professor Solomon just noted, um, the, the ideas and principles embodied in the Declaration are woven into lots of the specific provisions of the federal constitution are perhaps helpful in thinking about the meaning of some of those uh, specific provisions. Um, uh, but I don't think I'd want to take the, the declaration um, on its own terms and uh, independently uh, uh, take that as a source of constitutional law in and of itself. Um, for somewhat similar reasons, as I think we, we should be somewhat reluctant to take the preamble to the US constitution 
constitution um, as an independent um, source of, of law and try to directly um, apply it. Um, these things provide context that are helpful in, in thinking through the more specific rules that are embodied in the constitution, but ultimately what our aim is, is to interpret what those particular rules are, how we're implementing the principles that are embodied in the declaration and in the preamble to the constitution, uh, not simply uh, focusing directly um, on, on those principles. Any responses, Professor Jakeman? I, I thought both of those are really good answers. Uh, I would just cite in particular an example of, of my colleague, uh, Professor Philip Munoz, who's done some great work on looking at the notion of, of the inalienable right of religion and tracing it uh, not just directly from the Declaration to the, uh, the Constitution, but uh, as it comes through the various state uh, uh, declarations of rights and uh, then emerges as part of the broader conversation about the free exercise of religion, the liberty of conscience that goes into the First Amendment. So doing that kind of work, the uh, the the step by step, as opposed to um, just taking two great documents and trying to read them side by side without any intermediary, I think it, that's the harder way. Uh, the better way is to is to do the do all the footnotes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we've got a great great question from Carlos Nunez who asks the following. What do the panels think of Professor Drakeman's claim that strong form public meeting approaches are a departure from the way legal interpretation was long understood in the Western tradition? This is a bracing criticism because one of the attractions of Justice Scalia's approach is that he claims to be restoring a lost tradition, not engaging in a strong break from our tradition. Uh, if I could just clarify that a little bit. Um, I think, and I think if you, if you look at the evidence, the will of the lawmakers, just what you, you read over and over and over again in every language, you know, from, from the Roman era to the present. The objective public meaning of the language, of the, the words is as Blackstone said, it is the best evidence of the will of the lawmaker. Uh, but the, over those millennia, uh, constitutional theorists and courts looked at subjective meaning, objective meaning, they looked at updated objective meaning, and they looked at update, updated subjective meaning. And uh, to the extent that Justice Scalia focused on uh, the tradition of, of the semantic meaning or objective meaning, he's, he's not wrong about that but I think he overemphasized it as the only approach. Dynamic readings are, are ancient, uh, as are uh, you know, the use of uh, objective original meaning versus objective uh, dynamic reading, all were meant to point towards the will of the lawmaker. And we've kind of lost that, what did the lawmaker want to do here? Uh, and I think Justice Scalia, you know, every now and then cites the framers. I mean, even he can't resist going into the debates and pulling out some language that's useful uh, or updating a provision about search and seizure. Uh, so I, I think that, that it was a great rhetorical argument uh, to focus on the public meaning. And I don't think we had to lose that in my push for intentionalism, but I think that, that the the public meaning points to the intent it, and together they ought to give you what's really going on. Yeah, if, if I could address this question and this gets me, it gives me the opportunity to share a slide that I didn't get to. Uh, I think that um, uh, it's very important to understand that the United States Constitution is different in a profound way, right? So uh, the United States Constitution begins, we the people who are ordaining and establishing this constitution. So uh, the idea of popular sovereignty is an idea that, that the relevant lawmakers are the people. Uh, and uh, then from that assumption, I think it follows 
that uh, if we if we are looking for the will of the lawmaker and the lawmaker is the is the people is we the people that the relevant meaning is the meaning that was ratified by the intensely popular process of ratification in Pauline Mayer, Meyer's book uh, on the ratification process a really wonderful book uh, uh, by an author who died uh, way too young um, uh, really uh, shows how intense the public participation in the ratification process was with town meetings where citizens read the constitution out loud to each other and debated its provisions, right? And, and the, so, the, and, and, and this is the source of the idea that John Marshall articulates in Gibbons v. Ogden. In the 19th century, uh, uh, there are lots of statements about statutory interpretation that emphasize legislative intent. That's for sure true. Um, but uh, uh, there are dozens and dozens of statements uh, by Supreme Court justices, treatise writers, uh, 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 participants in the Philadelphia Convention, uh, emphasizing the idea that it's a public document with an ordinary meaning that has to be comprehensible by the people. And the framers knew that. So they intended to write a document that would be understood by the public. So in, in sort of technical jargon, that is they had a second order communicative intention to convey public meaning. Thank you. Um, it looks like we've got time for one more question, and this is from Carl Esbeck. Um, do federal interpretations of the Constitution and Bill of Rights for the first 20 to 40 years after 1789 have a heightened role in intent or meaning? So Lord Coke would, would say back in, in, in his institutes and Blackstone would pick up on this that the interpretation of, of people at the time of enactment is something to be taken very seriously. Uh, and if some of those people were framers, as in my example of Justice Patterson, uh, then I think that, that it gives you some very interesting evidence. It doesn't mean they, they aren't wrong or, they, or that they are interpreting it as, as we would like to see it or as we think is done correctly if we were to look at the entire context of the language as well as the circumstances. But certainly there's a very, very old maxim in the law uh, that says uh, contemporary expressions of, of uh, interpretation are meaningful. I wish I could quote the Latin to you, but it slips my mind at the moment. We wouldn't understand that anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> of course we would all. <laughs> <laughs> any other, any other, um... Responses or final closing words to offer as we reach the end. I would just echo on that on that point that, uh, as Professor Dregman said, that the early interpretations ought to be taken very seriously. But we also shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the early interpreters are also politicians and judges in their own right. Um, they're affected by their own um, uh, pressures. Um, and just like we think it's possible for judges and politicians to get constitutional meaning wrong today um, uh, for all kinds of reasons, not only through mistakes, but also because sometimes they simply uh, depart from the constitutional rule because it's politically convenient um, uh, or, or they feel the need to do so. Um, that was true in the early days as well. And so we should take early interpretations very seriously, uh, but we shouldn't think that they're necessarily dispositive of what the authoritative meaning actually is. Well, that seems like a wonderful place to end as we hit 1 p.m. sharp. I know many people on here have taken out time to hear this important conversation. I'd like to thank all three of our panelists. Um, Professor Drakeman, thank you for this wonderful book, which really contributes a lot, not only to this conversation that we've had here today, but also to the broader conversation about originalism and how both scholars and judges should be looking at um, determining the meaning of the Constitution and its provisions. Thank you to Professors Whittington and Solem for giving us such an engaging discussion and a lot to think about. We had a lot of questions, great questions that we weren't able to get to, um, but I'm hopeful that these will keep coming up and this 
similar panels and others in the future, I think we'll have a lot of debate as your book gets more widely read and reviewed and discussed. So I appreciate everyone's time and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Really appreciate everybody, but thank you especially to the panel. Super. Thanks very much, everyone. Just a quick thanks on behalf of the Federalist Society uh, to Judge Grant, especially for taking time and, and all of our panelists uh, for tuning in for our great audience, your great questions. We didn't get to all of them as Judge mentioned, but do tune back in and be checking your emails and our website for announcements about upcoming Teleform calls and Zoom events like this one. Um, so with that, we won't keep you any longer. Uh, until next time, we are adjourned. Thank you, Nick. That was great.